Hi, I'm Curtis Dickinson, Minister of Finance. Welcome to Bermuda, Your Money, Your Future, a discussion on relevant financial topics. This program aims to equip you with the knowledge to better understand financial terminology and activities. This is an opportunity to expand your understanding of financial matters, and most importantly, we want to hear from you. Welcome back to the second episode of Bermuda, your money, your future. And today's episode is banking. My name is Ken Dickinson, I'm your host. I'm a content creator and co-owner of Bar Memes. I'm also a radio personality and an e-channel specialist at Clarion Bank. And today I'm joined by the Honorable Curtis Dickinson, who is the Minister of Finance. I'm also joined by Nabil Grant, who is the Head of Corporate Banking at HSBC. And also Shaka James, who is the Assistant Director of Banking, Trust, Corporate Service, and investment division at the Bermuda Monetary Authority. So welcome. And right before we kick everything off, because in this episode, we're gonna cover everything from, you know, the history of banking, what it looks like currently, and also what does it look like in the future? Because it's changing rapidly like every other industry. So we'll be right back, but we have an exciting video right now to just break down everything when it comes to banking. We all use banks. People, businesses, trusts, charities, and even governments all deposit money into a bank. And we do this for three primary reasons. Number one, safety. Banks provide its customers comfort that they can keep their money safe and protected at all times. Number two, interest. Banks traditionally pay depositors money in the form of interest just for depositing their money with them. The more you deposit and the longer you deposit, the more interest you earn. And number three, access. A typical savings account not only allows customers to deposit and withdraw from their account at any time, but also allows for easy access to transfer and make payments around the world. Therefore, not only is the bank keeping the customer's money safe and paying interest, it also allows the customer the ability to access those funds at any time. So now that we've discussed why we deposit our money into a bank, Let's discuss what a typical bank does with the deposits and ultimately how they generate income. To start, it's important to note there are two key components, net interest income and fee income. Net interest income is simply the difference between the interest the bank receives and the interest they pay out. Let's use Mike as a simple example. Mike deposits $10,000 at Longtail Bank for one year, earning an interest rate of 1%. That means, at the end of the year, the bank will pay Mike $100 in interest. Longtail Bank then takes Mike's $10,000 deposit and typically does three things. It lends some of it out, invests some of it in the markets, and finally holds some of it for liquidity or when customers withdraw. For this example, let's assume the bank lends $6,000 of Mike's deposit, charging an interest rate of 7% invest $2,000 in the market, earning an interest rate of 3%, and the remaining $2,000 of Mike's deposit is held for short-term liquidity purposes, earning 0%. In this example, at the end of the year, Longtail Bank earned $480 from Mike's deposit and pays Mike $100. Therefore, Longtail Bank made $380 in net interest income which is the difference between the interest they received on lending and investing Mike's deposit and the interest they paid to Mike on his deposit. The other key component is fee income. This is the revenue received from the product and service related charges. For example, an account maintenance fee, online banking fee, credit card fee, over the limit fee, loan arrangement fee, and so on. These two components, net interest income and fee income are the key revenue sources for banks. And for the final part of this video, let's discuss some critical roles banks play in the economy. Number one, banks provide capital to individuals and businesses with the understanding that they'll use those funds for productive purposes within the country, thereby making banks instrumental in the country's economic development. Number two, the local banking industry are leading employers with over a thousand people in Bermuda directly employed within the industry. 
Not only are people directly employed by banks, as a result of banks providing capital to individuals and businesses, they also indirectly provide even further employment opportunities. Number three, banks provide a platform for international trade and industry. Simply put, banks provide products and services designed to make it easier to do business both locally and internationally, as well as allow customers the ability to buy and sell items around the world through the facilitation of payments. Number four, banks help to maintain Bermuda's strong and internationally recognized reputation, which is needed to keep our existing international business and encourage more to domicile on island. And number five, banks are able to provide its customers with adequate business and financial advice, including the products and services that promote and encourage saving. Not everyone is a financial expert, and so banks are also there to provide guidance to help you improve your business and personal financial position. So there you have it, a brief understanding of why we deposit, what banks do with deposits, and the critical role banks play in our economy. Welcome back, Bermuda, your money, your future. And hopefully after watching that video, you have a better understanding as to the basics to banking. But let's dive a little bit deeper and find out what it looks like here in Bermuda. In the United States, they have a Federal Reserve, and in other countries, they have different central banks. But in Bermuda, that's not the case. So the dynamic is a little bit different. So we're gonna let, get to know our panelists a little bit better and also they'll explain their role in putting together how this puzzle works here in Bermuda. So let's start with the minister, the Honorable Curtis Dickinson. Uh, the government is responsible for the legislative part of the banking system. So how does that work? Well, we make laws. So we are responsible for um, ensuring that the legislation that's currently in place is relevant. In as much as it isn't, we work with the banking industry, we work with the regulator to make sure that we understand what is current and what is appropriate for Bermuda, and if things are not, then we work towards affecting change. As a, as a politician, um, my job is also to have a, a look at how banking impacts the broader Bermudian customers. And so uh, I try to uh, take into consideration the concerns of the people who banks and I'm here to serve. Okay. And we're going to jump across to Shaka James as the Bermuda Monetary Authority is responsible for policy and guidance. So what does that look like? I know you wear a lot of hats over at the Bermuda Monetary Authority. So um, like I said, my name is Shaka James. I've been with the authority for um, a little over 13 years now. Um, solely in the sort of banking and uh, sort of larger organizational um, supervision. Um, how we supervise is based on, like Mr. Dis um, the Minister um, indicated, it will be taking those laws that the government has uh, instituted and looking at international best practice um, and then putting together a group of policies and guidance that provides limits and recommendations for the banking industry to sort of operate and follow. So as they are progressing through their business plans, we meet with them, we do on-sites, and we um, sort of regulate how they do business. Okay. And Naval Grant, sure. so what's exciting about this program is that there's a mix of you know, private and, and public and regulatory, and uh, you represent in the HSBC Bank, sure. uh, you're the financial solutions provider. That's yeah. your part to this puzzle. Yeah, it sounds pretty impressive. Uh, I tell you, my, my role is head of corporate banking. I have responsibility for four primary sections within corporate banking, uh, which is the international client base. So a lot of the connectivity with the Fortune 500 clients, uh, as well as our corporate real estate book of business that looks at large commercial property developments, large hotels, and the like. I uh, also have captive and insurance in that portfolio, uh, everything except the sort of large class four reinsurance companies. Uh, and then the last piece, uh, we have a funds business. So these are all the sort of key elements of the sort of wholesale or commercial environment that you would see in Bermuda uh, and in banking as well. And I, you, you just said you've been in, in the industry for quite some time. Yeah. I remember, I think we're almost in the same 
age bracket, relatively speaking. I remember I my behave. parents walking in <laughs> to a branch with a ledger book back in the day, yes. right? And now, you know, I, I don't have on my Apple Watch today, but there's things like contactless payments. So hopefully we'll go through the whole spectrum. But True. in your opinion, I mean, how fast of a pace of innovation are we undertaking right now currently? Yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting question. I think if you look at the days where we would have passbooks all the way to progress to online banking, uh, and then you would have the advent of and the growth of sort of debit and credit card usage and tap and chip and pin and all. So innovation and change is going to be a key part of any, any industry, and especially you're going to see that in banking as well. So, you know, we, if you project back to when you were probably in, in high school, you know, we, we all thought we would be driving flying cars and these sorts of things, but <laughs> it hasn't happened yet. But, uh, but I think that the pr progression of change with technology will come swift and fast. Right. And with the Bermuda Monetary Authority, is it, you know, it's, it's, it's keeping up with all of these, you know, products and services and solutions as are happening rapidly. You're, you're having to, you know, right. oversee a lot of this. Correct. Uh, you know, part of our process is to sort of always be in the relationship with government and the industry to sort of assess the changes that are happening, do our sort of homework to determine what some of the implications would be. Um, for example, um, the transition into more digital-based banking, contact -like payments, and just the way people access banking now has changed. Mm -hmm. So that also creates an avenue of new abilities for risks. And this is where um, AML, anti-money laundering, and, and sort of those restrictions to help manage how people access money is going to be key for us. Mm -hmm. And l constantly looking at our rules and our guidance to allow us to make those flexible changes that will allow industry to move forward, right. but also not put the financial structure at risk. Right. And Minister, of course, the government needs banking as well to carry out it, its role as Minister of Finance. How does that play into all of this? Well, any properly functioning economy uh, needs to have banking at the heart of it and so banks help to facilitate the movement of money between counterparties and so uh, we think having strong banks is important we also think having a good co competitive environment is important i think one of the things we're talking about technology just now and and innovation and i think that has been uh, the thing that has kind of brought uh, banking full speed ahead um, people want access to their money quicker i think there's a bit of a dichotomy that exists between uh, folks who uh, are older and who are used to doing banking the old way of going sending in line and cashing a check and and young people like my children who uh, everything is put on a card and they can just use a card as opposed to carrying around cash and uh, I think that is actually a good thing but any anything that helps to kind of move money around an economy is important so banks have a very important role to play in any properly functioning economy right. okay and any anyone can jump in in this question I think it's a cool question to ask, what would the world be like or what would Bermuda be like without the banking system? Well, as I just said, banking systems are, banks are important to any pro properly functioning economy. Now, the, I would say that banks have changed considerably as time has gone on, um, but the functions that they provide are essential, and now you have uh, payment type companies that are, are in existence to facilitate making payments faster and so there's been a bit of an evolution um, but make no mistake about it the services that they're providing the ability to kind of move funds between counterparties is essential to what banks do or anyone in the banking space does mm -hmm. so I don't ever see a future without banks I think banks will probably be in different forms but uh, the things that they do are very important mm -hmm. And I, I like what you said, banking in, in perha perhaps a, a different form. Yeah, Are banks as we know them still going to exist? Yeah, it's, it's if, if I was able to see into the future, I probably wouldn't be sitting on this panel. I'm probably lying on the beach in Tahiti somewhere. But, uh, you know, ultimately w what I see, especially for Bermuda, it becomes even more critical because we're talking about connecting Bermuda to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we don't produce anything here specifically uh, outside of smiles and service. And so everything else in terms of what we have to bring to the island has to be sourced and provided and paid for. So again, another critical part of that. And, you know, given the sort of two key parts of our industry, tourism, international business, all of that needs to be able to facilitate some sort of payment mechanism 
whether it's at your hotel bill, whether it's you know covering an insurance claim, or whether it's traveling overseas on your own vacation. So, you know, critically important. Now, what that looks like in terms of structure and payment, you, we talked about the advent from just from your passbook savings to you know digital payment, and, and so we'd have to look at what that that next piece looks like, which is largely dictated by the changes in the economy and the changes in the world. So those those will be the key drivers because banks are you know, sum total of the community that they serve. All right, Bermuda, your money, your future. We're gonna come back in just a moment. If I do a good job today hosting, hopefully I'll walk out with more money than I came in and hopefully you watching, you wanna know how you can earn, save more money. And so we're gonna give you some insight into exactly how that works and how you can be more successful. So we'll be right back, Bermuda. Your money, your future. In this video, we'll discuss a standard bank loan and some things to consider when applying for a loan. For this example, let's use Tracy. Tracy is hoping to purchase a brand new car, but doesn't currently have the money for it so she decides to look for a car loan. The first thing Tracy is encouraged to do is shop around. It's important she reviews several options and chooses the loan offer that makes the most sense to her financially. Once approved, the bank agrees to lend Tracy $30,000 to buy a new car. It's important to note, however, that before the $30,000 is transferred, Tracy is required to make a down payment which is often a certain percentage of the car being purchased. The amount borrowed, in Tracy's case the 30,000, is the principal amount. But the bank will also require Tracy to make additional payments called interest, which is the income the bank expects to receive for taking the risk of lending Tracy the money. Another key point for Tracy to consider when discussing her loan is the interest rate and whether the rate is fixed or variable. A fixed rate is an interest rate that does not change for the term of the loan. If the interest rate is 7% for the first payment, it will be 7% for the last. A variable rate is an interest rate that is subject to change. The rate can vary depending on local and international market conditions. Therefore, if it's 7% at the beginning, it can go up or down at any time. Tracy should also consider the term of the loan. This is the period, or length of time, the loan is to be repaid. The shorter the term, typically the higher your payments. In other words, the quicker you plan to pay the loan off, naturally the payments are expected to be higher in order to do so. Finally, for Tracy to understand her loan, she must consider the payment schedule. Before agreeing to borrow the funds, Tracy should know the monthly payment amount, how much of each month's payment is being applied to interest, and how much is being applied to principal. Tracy should also understand if there is a large payment expected at the end of the loan and how additional payments will impact the loan. We hope this example of Tracy's car loan has given you some insight of how a loan works and the things to consider. The key is to know and understand the loan deal before you sign and accept the money. Welcome back, Bermuda. Your money, your future. And in this segment, we're going to focus on best practices within the banking sector. And so, you know, parents and grandparents and your elders always gave you these tips, but we have experts here. So we're gonna get some tips when it comes to, you know, making money, saving money. And um, let's start with uh, looking at your statements. We can't just assume things are just okay. There's a reason why we have these long statements with a list of transactions and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts on, on just, you know, eyeballing your own transactions and stuff like that? Sure, it, it, it's, there's a few reasons why I would recommend you review your statement. 
one in this ever-changing world where, where we talk a little bit about anti-money laundering and the like, but the, the risk of fraud could be high. So you're looking at your transactional activity just to make sure that where you've spent your money, what you've done with your money is exactly what's recorded there. Because it gives you an opportunity to go back and say, that's not correct, what is that? And it could alert uh, the bank as well as yourself if, if you've been a potential victim of fraud. That, that would be the first thing. And then you want to make sure what you agreed with your bank or what you agreed uh, with uh, what you expected to see in terms of your income, your salary, and the like, as well as some of your expenses, because it's a good tool to track and keep an idea of where you're spending your money. Uh, because you can't make changes, you can't adjust and start to save money unless there's uh, a plan. Mm -hmm. And so having, a, having that in front of you and seeing where you spend your money is a, a critical part of that. And then the last thing is just to make sure that whatever fees that you have agreed are reflected correctly in your statement. Right. And you have the option of paper statements and electronic statements. Yeah, so the encouragement is always, and we talked about this ever-changing world, is that you, know, you would do more electronically because the time that it, it gets printed, it gets put in the mail, it shows up at your house, it takes some time to review, it's always better for that to be in real time. So if you have access to your online statements or reviewing your online activity, it's probably a better practice yeah. uh, than, than waiting for it to show up in your mailbox. Better for the environment too. Absolutely. Yeah. Shaka? From a banking perspective, when it comes to how you as a consumer interact with your bank, it's important for you to be aware of what capacity um, the bank has in terms of its services. So for example, the, uh, the banks have a sort of association that they have, the Bankers Bermuda's Association, uh, um, Bermuda Bankers Association, sorry. And they have a code of practice which is basically lays out exactly how the banks intend to provide their service to you, what that expectation is in terms of delivering the service that you need. If you understand that before you walk into the institution, you will be able to have a better sort of experience. And also uh, that leads into sort of better practices and understanding why when you get your statement, your interest rate has changed on your credit card statement. Oh, did you miss, miss certain payments? Did you do certain things? Understanding how your account is supposed to operate and when they fall out of line, there are some implications that could happen. Minister? So I agree with, with all that both Neville and Shaka have said. I think there's an element of personal responsibility here. Um, you know, there's no better steward of your money than yourself. And you check your statements to make sure that what you put in, what you take out, has actually been properly recorded. Um, I always say that it is important to kind of know your own information. Uh, in our last episode, we talked about pensions and how I had heard stories from, from citizens around getting their, their statements and not finding that there was no money in, inside of their accounts. When you check your statements regularly, you can be alerted to a problem fairly soon and that you can adequately deal with it. Uh, and talking about conduct, I think, you know, the we talked earlier in, in the segment about uh, transformation and how banks are innovating and um, they're innovating not only in their with their systems but they're also in their practices of how they engage their customers uh, I can remember stories of people telling me about being afraid to go inside of a bank and now you can see banks have marketing efforts that are outwardly encouraging people to come in um, those things are really important and I think customers need to understand what they expect from their bank they need to be open to asking questions of their banks around the products that the banks are selling because an informed customer is actually a better customer. Mm -hmm. And in as much as you are uh, learning about what it is you're doing inside the bank, uh, the better you're able to track kind of your progress in whether it's a loan or making some investments or saving money, um, you can track how those uh, products are progressing against what you thought was going to actually happen. I mean, it makes sense that this, sec this series is called Your Money, Your Future and that there's a personal responsibility for keeping track of, of things. Um, and then there's the fact that, you know, with banks who offer various financial solutions, um, a lot of which are at this point sort of commoditized, that there are different fees that are, you know, differ between institutions. Um, so one shouldn't just assume that what they're getting is the best uh, that they can get. And, it, and I guess it depends on what it is that you're, you're uh, looking to do and how you're trying to navigate. 
is it a good best practice to shop around? I, I would say yes, right? And, and the minister mentioned and informed customers a better customer. Sometimes fees are a function of banking. It's a part of how uh, bankers are going to make their money. Uh, but it's also sometimes a function of a change in behavior as well. So there may be certain practices uh, like printing of statements, printing of checks that would be priced accordingly because it's not something that you would want to encourage. Uh, but certainly if there are other transactions that you would like to see uh, people do more on, it probably would be cheaper to be done online. Mm -hmm. And so and there are also fees associated with thought leadership. So if, if there's a sit down and a discussion in an advisory capacity, there may be a fee that is associated with that. So I, I always say shop around for sure because Again, you know, you're looking for your money. It's the best opportunity for you to better manage your finances. And fees are not bad. They're just a part of what it takes to operate a bank, right? Exactly. Okay. Now, as the Bermuda Monetary Authority, um, you know, overseeing all of this, what does that look like for you under your... Um. With respect to how um, the BMA regulates, um, we r our focus really is on sort of operational effectiv and the effectiveness of the institutions and how they interact with the jurisdiction and the safety and soundness. Um, as it relates to details like fees and um, lending limits and rates like that, we don't necessarily get too involved in that because we're more of a principle-based um, supervisor. So we, we establish sort of the specific outcomes that we expect a bank to achieve, but allow the institutions to come up with their policies, procedures, and the sort of um, rules that they would use to uh, um, accomplish those outcomes. It allows us to be a sort of a, how would you put a nimble regulator? Mm -hmm. So we can adjust to the needs of industry, we can adjust to the needs of the public, we can adjust to the needs of the government's initiatives to make those rules um, better suited for things to move forward and for things to change. Okay. It just before sure. uh, the, the minister jumps in, I think, I think it's also important as well because all of the banks would provide their terms and conditions. It's a part of the, any account opening package, it's a part of any solution. Mm -hmm. and, and even though it's a long document and it, and it looks like a, a little bit of a difficult read, I would say contained in there are all of the conditions of which you would engage your relationship with the bank. Mm -hmm. And so I would again encourage you, just like how you look at your statements, to read through those terms and conditions, because it will spell out exactly uh, what Shaka described. Right. And maybe there are certain line items that you just, you know, if you don't need a paper-based statement, and you're happy to do it online, and there's a charge for that, but you've never said specifically, I would like this just online, there's an opportunity for, you know, if you're reviewing the different fees associated with different things to, to save yourself some money. Absolutely. Yeah. My own sense is that, you know, customers need to do their work, um, but the financial institutions also need to help. There is a, uh, a difference in knowledge that exists between an average customer and an institution. And so what I'm mostly concerned about, focused on, is ensuring that there's a degree of transparency around what the bank does and how its products work and how they charge for it so that customers can again make an informed decision. I think for a lot of people, things around finance are, uh, are difficult to understand or are, are, are viewed as being complicated and so people tend to shy away from it. Um, the, the, the four of us uh, at various points in time have worked inside of banks um, or in Shaka's case, regulating banks um, so have an intimate knowledge of kind of how the banks work and how their products work. Um, so it's easy for us, um, but for the, the common man and woman on the street, um, banks can be somewhat intimidating and folks, if they don't understand that they can ask questions, if you're comfortable asking questions, um, will find themselves uh, signing up for something that they don't fully understand. Right. I have said before that I have uh, received emails uh, uh, sometimes as frequently as, as monthly from a, from a constituent who writes in all caps, single spaced, an entire eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. And it's a, it's a bit of a rant on um, banks and mortgages and why is it that 
their payment is mostly going towards interest versus paying down the principal. And my first instinct, uh, being a banker and being someone who has a, some been educated in finance, is that the, here's a person who followed the goal of buying a home but hasn't quite figured out how the financing of that purchase actually works because notwithstanding the rent, um, the construct of the payment is fairly typical um, in terms of in the beginning. Most of the payment goes towards interest and as time goes on, the principal piece takes a larger portion of the payment. And there are questions that customers can ask. Can I make this shorter? Is there a way that I can pay this down quicker? It, will I get a more attractive rate if I take a shorter term? What are the trade-offs that I'm going to be making if I do one versus the other? And those are kinds of questions that I think um, banks or financial institutions should be obliged to answer. Because I think, uh, again, an informed customer is a, is a better customer. Mm -hmm. Pay twice a month if you can? If you can or pay an extra payment every year, every, every, every year. So make yeah. a 13th payment every year. Okay. You can shorten your mortgage down considerably. Best practices, fixed and variable rates. Yes. Talking about mortgages with that, mm. credit. Okay. So the, the interest is essentially, you know, simplistically anyway, it's the, 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 the cost of doing business. This is the add on top of whatever principal is borrowed. And I, and I would say the best practice around fixed and variable would be it depends. It depends on the circumstance. Typically, and again, this is a general rule, a fixed payment is when you, a fixed loan facility is when you know exactly the amount that you need to pay at a particular time. It's, it is typically a little bit more expensive than the variable because what we're saying is at a, a certain point in time, you're going to make this particular interest payment over the course of life of this particular mm -hmm. uh, facility. For a variable, it's going to be depending on uh, the current rate and the current environment, and so that's going to move up and down. So both have their pros and cons. I mean, we can talk in, an infinitum about which one's better or worse, um, and so it really depends. Um, typically, a fixed facility is where you know that you don't want to be uh, susceptible to a uh, change in your income. Mm -hmm. uh, but it does mean that if there is a decline in interest rates, uh, that you're not going to participate in that. Right. So, but in that case, you're set that the amount that you're going to pay in terms of interest is yeah. set, is right. Yeah. right at that point. Okay. So, it, it, again, there's no right answer for it, right. it, it in, in terms of, you know, which one is better. They, they both have applicability under certain circumstances, but the key part about that is have a conversation right. uh, with your banker. If, if it's not with your banker, then it's with a trusted advisor. Okay. It's with somebody that has you know, a better understanding to the minister's point of you know, how some of these dynamics work and, and walk through that. Uh, because we will certainly have a conversation with you to make sure that it's appropriate for what you're trying to do. Uh, but again, you know, fixed variable is it, it, it would really depend. But the the other important piece about sort of you know interest rates is just be mindful of them, right? So your the, the different types of facilities will yield a different type of interest rate. So for example, your mortgage is probably going to be typically in a single digit annual percentage rate. A consumer loan is probably going to continue to be in your single digit. Uh, and your percentage rate, but it's probably going to be a little higher, right. largely because your mortgage is going to be backed by a property. It has some collateral of sorts. Uh, and then a consumer loan is typically, you know, boat, jet ski, you know, travel money, Disney, etc. It's probably going to have a higher risk because it's probably not secured by anything of tangible value. And then when you get into your credit card facilities, they're going to probably be in your low double digit interest rates. So the key piece about that is just be mindful. I've heard a lot of times people say, I'm in financial difficulty, they go get a cash advance on their credit card and pay their mortgage. So, but imagine what you're doing there. You're taking double digit interest rate and paying down or paying on a single digit expense, which makes it much more expensive. So without getting too deep into it in terms of how interest rates work, uh, that's probably your, your another best practice is just be mindful of what those different facilities look like uh, and then get advice. Uh, if it's not from your banker, get advice from somebody that knows. 
All right. Well, that wraps up, wrap, wraps up this segment of best practices. And, you know, if you're still scratching your head, look, financial stuff is, as, as the minister said, sometimes it can be complex. But the, the, the best thing is to, to do your homework and also know that you can ask questions. So we'll be right back. Bermuda, your money, your future. Welcome back to Bermuda, your money, your future. And for our final segment today on banking, this is the interactive part. So we, we received some, some questions through Bar Memes, which we're going to ask our panelists to weigh in on. And we're going to start uh, with the minister. But if you have your own questions, a reminder that you can email the minister. The email is ministeroffinance at gov.bm. So this question is, why are credit ratings so important? a big one. Well, we, uh, our economy in Bermuda is, a, a big part of it is based on the provision of financial services, most of them uh, to people outside of Bermuda through our insurance industry. But uh, locals are also impacted. Um, so we have credit ratings and the insurance sector and the banking sector are reliant on those ratings and those ratings help to determine the amount of capital that these firms need to set aside. Uh, in the case of insurance companies, capital is set aside to settle claims. And in the case of banks, capital is set, as set aside to, uh, to fund potential losses. Mm -hmm. And so in as much as the government's, or the sovereign's rating is negatively impacted, then the cost of capital for those companies that are based here in the case of the insurance companies whose rating cannot be higher than the sovereign rating, so they're, they're capped out at wherever we are, they have to put aside more capital, and as a result, um, it impacts their ability to generate return for their shareholders. Okay. The fix is to cut cost, uh, raise prices, or find another jurisdiction that has a more attractive cost of capital. On the banking side, uh, a decline in credit ratings could lead to higher rates of interest because the capital need to be set aside is larger and again people want to earn a return on their money this is the bank shareholders they will uh, either have to raise prices and or cut costs and the raised prices will be seen either in increased fees and or increases in interest rates on loans and credit products okay. so credit ratings are very important um, and I know the concept to a lot of people is um, can be make your eyes glaze over. And I've been talking about this quite a bit over the course of the last several weeks in my discussions with the public service unions. Um, but, but credit ratings are really important and um, help the country to maintain, at a minimum, uh, the, in, the important businesses that we have operating here today. Okay. Now this question is from Mr. Casey Masters. Are there any plans to regulate bank lending rates in the near future? So philosophically, I th like to believe myself as being a free market person. And what I would like to see happen in terms of how rates come down is not through direct government intervention, at least in terms of telling banks your rates need to be X. My pr preferred course of action is to encourage competition in the marketplace. and. One of the reasons behind, I guess, this, this series of episodes is to help to heighten awareness of the Bermuda public around financial services products. And I think customers know more, uh, they act differently, and understanding that they have a choice helps to promote, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the longer term, uh, better market activity by those persons who participate in the market. So um, an informed customer will help be one who shops around, uh, an informed customer who shops around will be one who banks will do more to try to attract and retain. And that typically will mean some sort of concessions around pricing or other services, in my mind. Okay. This next question is from Jazz DePont. Why are mortgage rates in Bermuda so high when the cost of borrowing remains low? Okay, so it's, it's a good question. We, we talked a little bit about this earlier in terms of Bermuda structure. 
as a currency board rather uh, than uh, you know sort of a central bank model. <coughs> and so there's probably three drivers I would say. The first piece is we don't have access to the likes of a Federal Reserve uh, where we can borrow at very inexpensive rates. Uh, so it, you know, it relies and falls uh, back to the bank to look at those particular contributions. And then the other piece is the cost of doing business in Bermuda. It, it's relatively expensive. And so that's going to be a contributing factor uh, into that price. The, the, the other piece that is going to be uh, key as well is the banks, uh, we don't have the, the backing and funding of what you would see structurally in the United States. Uh, so the bank becomes a lender of last resort and ultimately means that we have to appear in pricing and for any losses. And so those are going to be the, the, the primary drivers be, between the difference between uh, what you would see in the U.S. in terms of low rates and, and Bermuda. Okay. I guess also from that perspective, it, uh, it sort of ties into what the minister talked about in terms of the, um, the, rating, the rating of the country. So it, it really impacts the cost of capital for the institutions. And that being reflected that because capital in itself is probably the most expensive form of funding a bank's balance sheet, within Bermuda, because we don't have the concept of a lender of last resort where we have a central bank that can lend to the banking industry, the banks in Bermuda have more capital than most banks you would see in other jurisdictions. And that's a uh, sort of element of the regulatory regime that we have to create that level of sort of safety and soundness as it relates to a potential failure of an entity to limit that because, you know, given the size of the industry spread around four institutions at this point in time, having a failure here could be um, sort of very material to the financial um, stability of the island. So having high levels of capital adds that um, safety and soundness, but it's expensive. And that has to be reflected even in the overall cost of the bank doing business. Okay, and I'm going to sneak two more questions in if I can. This one is from Talent J.C. Clark. Uh, when will Bermuda have a bank that can bank cannabis businesses? So... This question and this issue is very topical of days because I think there's quite a bit of buzz around the legalization of cannabis in Bermuda. Um, the banks here in Bermuda also have banks. So in order to facilitate, let's say, paying uh, college tuition for a kid who is in Canada, you would send your money through a Bermuda bank who would send it onward to a bank in Canada. And the bank in the middle is called a correspondent bank. And um, most Bermuda banks, I think three of the four of them, have uh, fairly substantial correspondence. And the other bank is a global bank. Um, but the correspondents uh, have some real concerns around AML, anti-money laundering concerns around uh, cannabis. And so in as much as the correspondents are not receptive to dealing with uh, proceeds of cannabis, then it puts a limitation on the local bank's ability to be able to bank uh, monies from that, that business. And so there's a lot of work that needs to be done to kind of understand what the risk is uh, before the correspondents uh, can uh, get comfortable. I, you would know, have worked in a bank for a long time before taking on this job and one of the jobs I did in the banks was running the treasury function. So I was the one responsible for all the banks banking relationships with other banks and on two occasions received correspondence from a correspondent bank saying that we're exiting our relationships with you. you know, that's, this could have put uh, Butterfield's customers back then when I was working at Butterfield at real risk of not being able to move their money around the world because our correspondents had basically advised us that they were exiting the relationships. Fortunately, we were able to replace those correspondent relationships, but banks stay concerned around the stability of these relationships because it's very important to them to be able to facilitate payments for, on behalf of their customers. Okay, final question of Bermuda, your money, your future, and this does talk about the future. Um, this is coming from Margaret Oliana. I pronounce that right. Why doesn't Bermuda have digital banks yet? Who wants to take that one on? It's a, pr it's a pretty 2020. Uh, so 
all the banks now, the, pr the majority of our business is digitally based now. So I suspect that they're, they're really talking about you know, the next evolution. So we, we've talked a lot about you know, fintech. And, and I would say, as a banking industry, we're probably more interested in, in fintech than we would be in you know, the sort of cryptocurrency discussion. And I think fintech is going to drive banking into the future. It, it, it's going to reduce the amount of paper. It's going to uh, streamline processes. And it's going to bring innovation, uh, without a doubt. Uh, but just as the minister described, there, there are challenges that come along with uh, in investment in, in cryptocurrency and the like. And, uh, so maybe it's an opportunity to, to look at entrepreneurship in that space. And the, um, the authority has sort of seen a lot of that interest in that space. Um, I think people need to be mindful that um, when it comes to providing financial services, so there's a level of fiduciary trust that's required. Um, you're dealing with other people's money. So setting up an institution, a bank, whether it's just basic payment services and all, all that, like it needs to be well thought through. So with that yeah, the BMA is very keen on seeing the industry sort of move and transition into these new sort of fintech spaces. Um, to Neville's point, we recognize that also provides a level of cost savings from even providing lending and other f fee bases to, to customers would be a lot cheaper. Um, but we also have to be mindful of the safety and soundness in that space. We've met with several different people who have been interested in starting that, but we haven't unfortunately seen any applications come through as yet. But we, we're hopeful that we'll see some level of, of, of change in, in, in the future. Right. Minister, final word? Um, I'm looking forward to uh, continued innovation in the banking space. I think the next great frontier is digital banking. Uh, um, beyond what we currently see today, I think it's more, the question is probably more related to fintech. Um, and I think uh, banks are also looking forward to because I think it gives them a way to make um, their, their business models more efficient and it's a way of being able to deliver solutions to customers uh, more efficiently, more quickly. Thanks a lot, Minister and our guests for this episode, the second of Bermuda, Your Money, Your Future. And we hope that you've learned a lot, uh, everything from how banking works to best practices to uh, your questions that can continue to come in, continue to email us, and that is Minister of Finance at gov.bm. We look forward to seeing you at the next episode of Bermuda, Your Money, Your Future. Thank you all for joining us, and thank you to our guests. Thank you also for your feedback. The goal of this program is to equip you with the knowledge to make better financial decisions and to manage financial resources effectively. We hope that this information will help you to achieve your financial goals. If you have any questions or comments, please send them to ministerfinance at gov.bm.